the last bit of our coverage on cash flows and ratios is the area I'm going to be looking at today. The topic that causes the biggest problem for students is something called interpretation, ratios and interpretation. Now, there are one or two danger points that you must be careful of, and that is when the examiner says to you, please work out some ratios and then do some discussion, you must remember that about a third of the marks, indeed that's the maximum of the marks, a third of the marks are for the ratios themselves, and the other two-thirds is for the discussion. Now, the question I'm about to look at is where the examiner gives you a scenario where you're working for a large company, and the directors of that company have asked you for your advice as to which of two companies you'd recommend that they buy. Obviously, it's their decision. It depends on the price and so many different things. But as far as you're concerned, you've got to do some kind of analysis to make sure you put forward enough um, explanation for the directors to base their decisions on. Now, the, you're given two companies and you've got to analyze, do some ratios. So what happened in this question was the examiner gave you uh, eight ratios, or was it, might have been 12 ratios, beg your pardon, 12 ratios for eight marks. Uh, very often it's one mark per ratio, but this time they asked you to do 12 ratios for eight marks, a bit tight. And they gave you the ratios of one of the companies, incidentally called something like Grappa, and you had to work out the ratios for another company called Merlot, two great wine companies as it happens. Um, but the question doesn't tell you what business they're in. But there are two companies, uh, one called Grappa, one called Merlot. You're advising a big company as to which one to buy. So what I'm proposing to do, since it is a topic that's done so badly by students, I've decided to approach it almost like a case study. So give me plenty of time to explain uh, going into as much depth as we can about how to do these ratios questions. So don't forget the point I was making a couple of minutes ago where the examiner says do some ratios and then interpret them. The unwritten rule that the examiner has spoken to us about, he and his markers give up to one third of the marks for the numbers and two-thirds of the marks for the discussion. So even if your numbers takes a long time to do, you must make sure you have enough time to do the writing, the discussion, because that's two-thirds of the marks. And so we look at our question called Vic Chiller. I apologize for the uh, quality of the um, PDF print on screen, but I hope you can read that. You will be given a copy of the actual material um, online, which comes from the uh, exam itself. So please have a look at that. But I hope you can read that screen. I, I hadn't realized how light it was on this particular machine, but I hope you can read it. I'll leave it on the screen for a few extra seconds because of that, so you can have a look at it. So your first task is to read the question. It's a topic that's done very, very badly uh, but not as badly as standards. Apparently that's done even worse by students. So it's the second worst topic done in the exam every time it's set. So you'd either get a ratios interpretation question, which is what I'm doing, or you get a cash flow, sometimes with some interpretation as well. So interpretation comes up all over the place um, in many, many sittings, and usually it's question three. Occasionally it turns up in question one as part of your consolidation discussion. So, I'm going to give you a chance to read the question, and you and I are going to approach it almost like a case study, going deep into uh, different points that the examiner would like to see. So, there you are. Let's read it together, maybe. Victula is a public company that would like to acquire 100% of a suitable private company. So, let's underline would like. It hasn't done it yet.
100% of a suitable private company, so it's a much smaller company, you see. It has obtained the following draft financial statements for two companies, Grappa and Merlot. They operate in the same industry, so let's pick up these hints. The examiner will give you clues, you see. Clues from the examiner. And as I'm sure you will remember from the main course, uh, he, he's written a famous article on how to pass interpretation questions, and he uses this expression, ignore the clues at your peril, meaning danger. So if you ignore the clues, you lose marks. If you pick up the clues, you gain marks. It's as simple as that. So look out for clues. In the same industry, so they're comparable, and their managements have indicated that they would be receptive to a takeover. Better underline that. In other words, they will not resist the takeover. They may be re nearing retirement or whatever, and they want to sell at a good price for whatever reason. So the, you've got a question called Grappa and Merlot. Uh, there's revenue, cost of sales, gross profit, operating expenses. Incidentally, what is the operating profit around here? Is that 1260? So that's the operating profit. And similarly here, I can call that 2000 as operating profit. So nice to just be aware of that because as you know with ratio analysis, we have this famous topic called, um, the famous ratio called return on capital employed. And you must be careful to pick up a profit, some suitable profit. Usually it's operating profit profit before interest and tax. So there you are, operating profit, profit before tax. The income tax expense is possible that Grappa has spent a lot of money on um, non-current assets and has claimed capital allowances. And so the taxable profit has gone down, which is possibly why the income tax is so low. On the other hand, if they were providing deferred tax, one would imagine the extra capital allowances would cause more deferred tax, and therefore you'd imagine that the income tax would actually be uh, somewhat higher. But there you are, uh, a lower figure than Merlot. Profit for the year, much the same. That is, of course, profit after tax, roughly the same. And if you note the dividends paid during the year, so let's highlight the word paid, paid during the year is 250 and 700. So would you agree that um, Grappa has retained more of its profit for reinvestment to safeguard the future, whereas Merlot seems to be giving away 70% of its profits as dividends? So can I say on the right, near Merlot, smaller retention, you see? Whereas 250 here, we can say more retained, reinvested in the future. So the 250 more retained because, as you can see, out of 900, if you've paid out 250, if you're the Grappa directors, it means the difference between 900 and 250, whatever that is, 650, that is retained. Whereas the other company is only retaining 300. So some differences there. The other thing I thought I'd point out is if your company called Victula, who you're advising, seeks to buy Merlot, they're taking on a company that's something like 70% bigger than Grappa. And surely that causes problems in itself because if you've got a much larger company, you have many more issues to deal with, many more staff, you have the capacity, the managerial capacity to cope with things like that. So something that you, is well worth mentioning to the examiner is 20.5 compared to 12,000. If you take the 20.5 and if you divide it by 12,000, you will see, of course, that it's 70% bigger. Seventy percent more. So clearly it's a much bigger option. If you buy Merlot, 
You might have all kinds of other issues. It's 70% bigger. Yes, that's nearly you know, three quarters bigger. So that's quite a big percentage. So remember things like that. Now, one thing I noticed, uh, having taught this topic for many, many years, as you read the examiner's questions, uh, you find that you need to spend more time on ratios, this, this particular topic, question three, more time on ratios interpretation as, uh, than any other topic on the grounds that there's so much in the question, there's so many clues that you've got to pick up. I picked up two or three already. The 70% being bigger, the fact that there's lots of capital allowances, the fact that there's more retained on the left, less retained on the right, etc., etc. One other thing that I must not miss as I carefully read the question, taking a lot of time over it, more time than you would have in the exam, of course, because I want to explain how to do it. This word lease is interesting, isn't it? Sounds like one company has a big leasing expense, interest or finance cost, the other one has nil. So that's going to make a difference to your profit in due course. So what else do we have? The statement of financial position. Uh, interesting that um, you have freehold factory on the left-hand side, nothing on the right. Owned plant, etc. And then again, you have that word leased plant. So you get the impression, of course, that the company on the right, Merlot, is leasing plant, whereas the company on the left doesn't seem to have anything on lease. So it seems to buy them outright. So if you're buying a company that has things on lease, uh, those assets don't really belong to Merlot. So you're paying for you know, profitability, maybe other things, but you're not actually paying much for the assets. So many companies who are buying other companies like to see good, solid, tangible assets. So maybe the company on the left might provide you with that opportunity. So everything I'm looking at, I'm trying to make some sense of, and that's the way to read these questions. Current assets, inventory, etc. Obviously, the inventory on the right, you expect it to be bigger because obviously the revenue is so much bigger. More needed to service larger sales revenues. So you're selling more, the company on the right, 70% bigger, we were saying. Trade receivables, ba bank's interesting, isn't it? That is interesting. So what I'm going to do is to put a little circle around this bank, positive bank, and down here I notice the other company has an overdraft. So what's that difference? Is that 600 or 1800? You're right, it's 1800. So what we're saying here is that it's 1800 worse off Merlot than Grappa. So very often when you buy another company, sometimes the banks will say you've got to guarantee the overdraft or maybe part of the you know, investment strategy to do so. So be careful. If, you, if the Victula directors were to buy Merlot, they're taking on board a big overdraft as well. So that's worthy of note bit of point of caution later. What else? Going back, uh, equity shares of $1 each, always underline those $1. Property revaluation reserve, that's interesting. Uh, notice the company on the left, Grappa, actually revalues its property. So well, I suppose I could say that the freehold factory without the 900 property revaluation would have been 3,500. So 3,500 plus the revaluation is presumably how they got the 4,400. So the revaluation is the move from cost to market value, fair value usually. So bear that in mind, one has revalued. That's going to make a dramatic difference to the ratios, as I'll explain in due course. So plenty there to go on. Anything else to mention? 7% and 10%, that's a big difference, don't you think? The 7% company and the 10%, uh, they both have borrowed 3,000, but one can get away with a 7% loan note. The other one has to pay 10%. It could have something to do with the credit rating of Merlot. Notice Merlot has an overdraft already, 
And so if it seeks to borrow more money through loan notes, it may be expected to pay more interest because the person lending the money to Merlot may uh, uh, top up the interest rate for risk because if you have a huge overdraft already and often the overdraft will be secured on property and so on, the person making the loan note um, investment in the company may feel that the overdraft the bank might have first call on property in case the company gets into trouble. So that's probably why it's 10% rather than 7%. So another clue from the examiner. Deferred tax, as you can see, quite high, which is strange. But there you are. Government grants. Now that's interesting. Government grants. Grants seems to be 1,200, and lower down here it's 400. Now, if you remember when we did our IAS 20 grants, there was a rule that said you had to split the grant at the year end between what is a current liability within 12 months and what is beyond that. So you can see here the non-current is, is 1,200 and the current is 400. What that means, of course, is the 400 in the next 12 months will be transferred to the income statement as a credit, usually reduced from cost of sales, uh, next year. And similarly, for the next three years beyond that, you'll have 400, 400, 400, uh, coming back to income statement or being credited to income statement, uh, representing the grant, of course, for years to come. So it seems like there are four years of 400 each, and of course that totals up to 1,600. So how does the government grant work? The government gives you a chunk of money, a big um, uh, bit of money, uh, as a refund for an investment in freehold property or plant, provided you're in a certain area where they seek to... Uh, encourage investment. So the government gives you almost like a refund of cash. I just wonder whether, I wonder whether the receipt of that cash has actually helped Grappa's bank balance. What do you think? I wonder if you can pick that up. Let's go have a look. You notice there that um, we've got 1600 at least coming from the government, plus something obviously for this year. And I wonder whether that has contributed to Grappa's better uh, cash and liquidity. It's got money in the bank of 600. I wonder whether the company on the right, Merlot, because it doesn't have grants. I mean, grants are cash, aren't they? So I wonder whether part of the reason why Grappa looks to have more cash is that they simply got it from the government. Yes, as a refund of the investment. So these are the kinds of points we've got to make later. Otherwise, the other interesting point, of course, is there are two finance lease obligations. As you can see, the, there's something there, and there's something here, you see. So I suppose one could say that the finance lease in total is 3,700. And so we read on. Take your time reading it. Certainly on this tape, I'm going to take a lot of time to explain as deeply as I can. On the second page, you realize this is a serious question. Both companies operate from similar premises. Now, what does that mean? Many people will read that and say, yeah, so what? Similar premises, so what? But what you need to do is to go back and say, what does this mean? Why has the examiner given us that hint? So let's go back and have a little think about it. Freehold property... For Grappa, 4.4 million. For Merlot, nil. So I reckon nil means you're renting. Renting the factory. Would you agree that will make an impact on your profit? Because if you own the factory, let's say Grappa on the left, you'll have some depreciation on buildings. That's fine. But if you are renting the factory, imagine what it must cost to rent a factory. A whole premises, you're renting the factory, you're renting the land, you're renting everything that, the, that, the, uh, that represents the factory. So obviously, if you compare depreciation on buildings, obviously you don't depreciate land, and then you, and then you compare the, that depreciation for Grappa to the renting by Merlot, Obviously, the, the cost of the renting will be much more than just appreciating. So that might make an impact on the profit in due course. 
So what else does that very revealing second, pa second page give us? Let's have a read. Additional details, details of the two companies' plant are as follows. Owned plant cost. Right now, let's listen to this. Owned plant cost is 8,000 and the other one's cost is 10,000. Let's flick back to the previous page immediately to see if we can pick up a clue from the examiner. Now here's a useful point. Are we happy that the owned plant is 5,000? These are all netbook values, of course. Carrying values after depreciation, accumulated depreciation. So if you agree that the plant cost on the second page 8,000 and the netbook value is 5,000, would you agree the accumulated depreciation must be 3,000? So let me move to that second page and see if we can write something down. Clearly, the accumulated depreciation must be 3,000. And here, of course, the accumulated depreciation must be 7,800, because the net book value, of course, on the previous page is 2,200, as it says there. So that's the accumulated depreciation. Now, what does that mean? A good student, let's hope we fall into that category, will think deeply about that issue and say, I wonder whether 7,800 means there's 22% of the asset's life left. 78% represents depreciation gone, including the current year. And obviously, the asset is 78% old and has 22% of its life left. So would you agree Merlot's assets are nearing the end of their lives, whereas Grappa's assets are relatively new because you've depreciated 3,000 out of 8,000. So that feels like about 37.5%. So one is about 37% used up, let's say 38, and the other is 78. So clearly, Merlot... If you buy Merlot, you might have to uh, think about getting new assets. And Merlot's policy seems to have been, director's policy, seems to be to move out of owning assets into leasing them. So that's an interesting point, the uh, liability that you take on board if you were to buy Merlot, because Merlot has lots of gearing, it looks like. Lease plant original value, nothing much there. The... There were no disposals, good news. The interest rate implicit within Merlot's finance leases is 7.5%. I'm leaving that on the screen along for a long time so you can read it. 7.5%, I might underline that. For the purpose of calculating ROC and gearing, all finance lease obligations are treated as long-term interest-bearing borrowings. So that's quite important. So gearing, ROC, finance leases must be included, it seems. The following ratios have been calculated for Grappa and can be taken to be correct. And if you number them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I did say to Steve Scott, the examiner, wasn't it a bit mean, Steve, to have 12 ratios for 8 marks? And he says, oh, don't worry about it, Francis. He said, uh, some will be 1.5 marks and some will be half marks. So where he feels it requires a bit more care and workings, he'll give one and a half marks, where it's something very much more obvious, he'll give half a mark. So he, he just assured me that it will be fair, whatever the marking guide does. And then the question says, as we read on, calculate for Merlot. So who are we calculating this for? Merlot, the company on the right. The ratio is equivalent to all those given for Grappa. You see? Now, he says in his uh, feedback and at meetings, amazingly, a certain number of candidates, a sizable minority, actually did the calculations not for Merlot, but for Grappa. The wrong company! Can you believe that? It must be either exam nerves or people just don't read questions carefully enough. So you imagine the marker getting 
the same the marker getting grappers ratios back for marking when the examiner has actually given you grappa. It's ridiculous. Especially where the examiner says, please, it's, please take it as correct. You see? It says there can be taken to be correct. You can't check the examiner. Okay, I admit that for the first ratio, return on capital employed, the, um, because the denominator, the thing underneath in, the, in a ratio, um, is given, it's not a problem. But how about the numerator? Is it before interest, after interest, before tax, after tax, all that kind of thing? So I'm going to be a little bit careful with my um, checking. So occasionally you might have to check the original ratio. So you use the same formula for the ratio that you've got, that you've got to do. But don't do it for everyone. That's a terrible waste of time. And then the question says, assess the relative performance. Of course, that's where the ratio analysis comes in. Relative performance and financial position of Grappa and Merlot for the year ended September 2008 to inform the directors in the acquisition decision. So you go to assess and acquisition de decision. Explain the limitations of ratio analysis and any further information that may, have been, that may be useful to the directors, etc., when making an acquisition decision. And uh, Steve was discussing at a meeting that um, if the students only mentioned limitations, five limitations, he told his markers to give full, a full five marks. But uh, if a student was able to mention further information, then they got some of those five marks. But the whole thing is limited at five. In other words, you could do three limitations and say two uh, additional information points and still get your five points. So the kind of additional information, if you notice in the very first page, uh, uh, very first paragraph, I should say, of the first page, it says something about it being a draft set of accounts. So I suppose you could ask for the final set. See, it says draft, so I suppose you could point out that you know we'd like to see a full set after being audited. Draft could be before the audit. That's one point, additional information. And the other, of course, additional information you can mention is um, what's the price? You see? Draft accounts only. So maybe unaudited. Not yet audited, so how much reliability can be placed on that? And the other one, of course, is price being asked by Grappa and Merlot owners. That's uh, well worth mentioning. So you can see those five marks at the end of a question are very, very easy to come by. Right, let's approach it almost, as I say, like a case study. So we take every point really, really seriously. My whole aim is to get lots of meaning out of this question rather than just rushing through it like I would an exam. So I'm trying to explain and I hope you're learning something. It's, it's a topic that's done very badly. I can't see why, really. It's quite straightforward. So let's have a look at how one might approach a question like this. For F7 exam question three, we have here a question called Victula. And the question says, calculate Merlot's ratio. So I better say that. Part A, calculation of Merlot's ratios, dollars, And so we're going to start by saying R-O-C-E. Now, just a little idea I had. Would you agree that when you're doing your Part B, and then time's running out, you've done your ratios and so on, when you're doing your Part B, don't you think it'd be a lovely idea to have Grappa and Merlot next to each other? Let's say Grappa for the first ratio is something like, is it 14.8%, say 14%, and Merlot may be, I don't know, 20%. 
So it would be a nice idea to keep them next to each other. So uh, my plan is to have uh, Grappa over here and Merlo over here, in one sense underlining Merlo because that's the one we're doing. So don't do Grappa right on top and then Merlo six inches lower down because it's very hard to check that. Or the worst kind of question, uh, the worst kind of approach to this question is to have Merlo in your workings and have to jump to the question every few seconds to see what Grappa was. Was it 14.8? What's Merlo? What's 14.8? What's Merlo? That kind of thing. It's very hard to even visually keep an eye on it. So you've got to keep it next to each other because you're doing analysis, you're comparing 14.8, 20%, whatever, which one's better, easier to see things next to each other. That'd be my advice. Otherwise, uh, as I said on, on the main tape, I presume I did, it's very hard to fail a, a ratios question. You just have to be a bit quick. But you get 60% for anything, almost anything you do. Provided you've do some, done some ratios carefully with a uh, calculator, I show, you a few, show a few steps, that's 8 out of 8. And then all you need is another 5 after the remaining 17. And that's very easy to come by because you're aiming for at least 13 out of 25. So you can't fail a ratios question. As I say, 60% is yours. If you do a few ratios, make a few comments, you'll get 60%. So it's, it's almost impossible to fail a ratios question. Now, what I thought I would do is to check G to see which return used by examiner to see which return is used by the examiner. So that's my, the main issue there. I could take a chance and say, well, I presume it's like that or whatever, but the examiner himself needed you to check it because it was one and a half mark. So a good student will check it gently before they move on. So what's the return, you see? The return on the first page, profit before tax, is said to be 10.50. So I'll say PBT, profit before tax, 10.50. Then you've got your loan finance cost of 210. And so you have 1260 somewhere here, you see. And so I'm going to divide the return by the capital employed, return on capital employed, R-O-C-E. The capital employed has been specifically mentioned in the formula, shareholders funds shareholders funds are said to be 5,500 on the first page. Uh, to that we must add apparently the loan, which is 3,000. And so that's 8,500. You divide one by the other, you can see there the 14.8. That's when you nervously look back at the question to see what the examiner had done. Oh yes, 14.8, no problem with that at all. So if I take you back to the question paper for one second, just to confirm that that's under control, 14.8, yes, it makes sense. I actually got that right, so there's some little encouragement, of course, if you're prepared to look for it. Okay, so that's Grappa's story. That's obviously for Grappa. But what's it for Merlot? That's where the marks really are. So let's start up our friend Merlot. Workings for Merlot. PBT, profit before tax, 1400. Lease interest, 290. And of course, the loan interest, interest or finance cost, is 300. So if you add them up, you're looking at 1990. 
You then divide by shareholders' funds, which is 2,800. Uh, then you've got your finance lease obligations, liabilities, 3,200. And if you remember, there's also a little 500 somewhere. So that's 3,700 strictly. And of course you have the 3,000 of the loan note itself. So both companies have the same loan note, of course, amount. So if you added that up, 28 plus 32 plus 3,000, of course, not forgetting the 500, I believe that's 9,500. And so as you take that upstairs, dividing one by the other, you'll come out to an answer somewhere around 20.9, I believe, 20.9%. Now, sensibly, what I ought to do at the end of that little exercise, if I can just extend the, the, those lines down a bit, Sorry about my lines. Apologies. So what we're going to say on the far left is that the Grappa company is 14.8 and Merlot, of course, is 20.9. And so you can make a decision as to which one you think is better. I suppose one has to say the higher the better. So I might give it a little bit of a tick. Now another good idea I find some people doing is um, using is just drawing a little line so the markers are no doubt as to which one you've just dealt with. So that's the end of the ROC, the return on capital employed. Let's try some more of these ratios. That was a bit of a messy one, took a long time. But in the exam, you will get a bit of extra credit for doing that. The next one, of course, is the pre-tax ROE, return on equity. So your profit before tax is said to be given as 1,400 pre-tax. And you divide, of course, by the equity of 2,000 return on equity 2,800 I suppose the company on the right so I'm going to divide by 2,800 shareholders funds and maybe I'll just write that on this side beg your pardon 2,800 and so you have your capital employed without using a calculator of course you can tell that that comes to 50 percent so we're speeding up a bit Whereas the company on the left, Grappa, is said to have a 19.1% given in question percentage. So you can pick that up from the question. So looking at the two, I suppose one has to give a most definite tick. We approve of the company on the right, Merlot, because it's so much bigger. And so our process continues. It's such an easy topic. It comes up regularly in exam done very badly. I can't see why. I don't feel that's too difficult a topic. can't compare it to consolidations and associates, some other tricks we do. But I don't know why people do so badly in the exam on that. It's nothing, really. Net assets turnover, which obviously means revenue on top, Revenue is 20,500 from the first page. And then you simply divide by, is a formula given? I think the formula is given in the question. Net assets, total assets, less current liabilities. So let's have our total assets minus the current liabilities. 
The total assets, of course, is 14,800. The current liability is, of course, 5,700. And so if you take one away from the other, that's 9,100. And so you divide one by the other, I believe the answer is 2.3 times, whereas the company on the left appears to be 1.2 times. And obviously the more number of times you turn it over, the more efficient your company is supposed to be. So I'm going to give a most definite tick to the company on the right. Do you get the general impression as you observe the trend between the two companies that actually Merlot seems to be a slightly more successful company? We seem to be ticking the company on the right, Merlot rather than Grappa. Interesting. So you've got to bear that in mind, all right? So that's our third ratio done. I might actually start another page at this sort of juncture. Depends on where it is for you, but let me just assume it's my second page. You might have different size handwriting, of course, but I'm going for average sized handwriting. So where should we go with this? Gross profit margin, the next one. So if I just put back on the screen the question itself to see how we are progressing. So we've done our return on capital employed, we've done our pre-tax profit, we've done our net assets. Notice the formula was given, total assets less current liabilities. And then beyond that we've got a couple of easy ones, gross profit margin, operating profit margin, current ratio. So have a little read, I'll pause for a second. Stop the tape now as you look at the question, please. So let's get back, start up our second lot of ratios. Once more, I request you draw some lines with me. All the way down the page for the Grappa and Molo companies. So let's have Grappa on the left, Merlo underline maybe on the right, and here we say Merlo calculations. Okay, thousands or whatever we're doing here. All right, let's see if I can win a bit more space, a few more longer lines, let's say. Sorry about those lines, the computer doesn't like me to touch the previous line. So I hope you can read that. Now, the um, next one, of course, is our fourth ratio, GP percentage, which is obviously GP, 2,500 gross profit from the question. Have a look, just below your cost of sales. Divided, of course, by 20.5 which is our revenue. And so the answer, of course, 12.2% using a calculator. The one on the left is 12.5. I don't suppose we should be too excited about 0.3%, but the one has to say that for the first time, Grappa seems to be winning. That's an interesting shift. Later we might make a comment about that. So that's the end of that particular ratio, if you want to draw lines separating them. So the markers in no doubt as to which items you're dealing with. And so we have our fifth ratio, operating profit percentage, which is clearly the gross profit minus 500 expenses, which is naturally 2,000 operating profit, divided by the revenue, 20.5, and I believe the answer 9.8% using a calculator, whereas this is 10.5%. And so if you look at the two, the one on the left seems to be winning comfortably, suddenly. Grappa, interesting. Let's try another one, current ratio. You can speed up in this area, this is very easy. Current ratio, is that current assets to current liabilities? sometimes known as working capital ratio. 
if you do your F5 and F9 and topics like that, excellent subjects that cover some ratios, especially F5. So current ratio, current assets to current liabilities. If you look at your, your question, you can see there that the current assets are 7,300 to current liabilities, which is 5,700. This is 1, and this is 1.3 to 1. Whereas the one on the left, I might have to rewrite that here, 1.3 to 1, whereas the one on the left, grappa, appears to be 1.2 to 1. So one has to say that 1.3 is better than 1.2, the more the better. Another way of interpreting it, I suppose, is you're trying to cover your current liabilities, which is why I've made this one, you see, and the current asset, uh, the current asset score seems to be 30% more than the current liability. So that 30% provides you with some kind of safety margin. Excuse me. So current ratio, no problem whatsoever. And so let's march on and take more territory, grab some more marks. There's obviously the closing inventory days. In days, stock holding period, something like that. The closing inventory appears to be 3,600, divided, of course, by cost of sales, which is 18,000. And if you multiply by 365, I believe the answer there is 73 days. The one on the left is 70 days. So out of the two, shall I go for the bigger, do you think? Of course not. The smaller is better. The shorter inventory holding period, the better. Because the longer you keep inventory, uh, the more it might deteriorate, become out of date, yes, uh, subject to you know, uh, damage, etc. But um, some industries, though, wines, it doesn't really say that this involves wines, but in some industries like winemaking, some chemicals, I suppose, the longer you keep it, the better it will get. Certainly with wines, one can say that. But generally speaking, I think you've got to be a little bit careful with that. I remember an exam question a few sittings earlier than this one, where the examiner said the company was involved in bread making. An excellent question called Breadline, available in the... Um, in the uh, revision kit, the um, company you're taking over, the, what happened there was because you're involved in bread, uh, the, if you had, comparing one year to another year for the same company, if you have seven days longer stock holding, inventory holding, and you're dealing with perishable goods, foodstuffs like bread, obviously that's not such a good idea, is it? Uh, to have bread that's seven days older than it used to be last year on average. People are not going to buy it because it's too hard for, for consumption, that kind of thing. So in some industries, the longer the better, but that's quite rare. In most industries, the shorter the better. And certainly, if you have something like perishable goods and foodstuffs, seven days longer does make a difference, I suppose. And that's the process, really. Such an easy topic. Just keep fighting for your marks. So that's the seventh ratio sorted. Let's try some more. So let's get rid of that particular ratio. The eighth ratio coming up, trade receivables in days. Collection period. The formula, I suppose, is trade receivables, which is 3,700, divided, of course, by revenue, and that's 20,500, multiplied by 365, and the answer, of course, 66 days. Whereas for the other company, it's 73 days.
So which one you, would you prefer? The other one, reason why I'm checking as we go along and ticking off the one we prefer is when we're doing our actual interpretation, the, it'll be a help to have made that decision in advance. So 66 or 73, shall we go for the more the better or the less the better? I suppose it'll have to be the less, the smaller, because you can see here the kind of comment we will make is Merlot um, takes seven days less time, fewer days, to collect their receivables from their credit customers, and so their liquidity should be a little bit better. Now, what else can we say here? Just one point of caution. Occasionally, I've seen the examiner do this too, but it's very, very occasional. Uh, this must be credit sales only, not cash sales, strictly. Obviously, in this question where it's not specified, I'm going to assume the old credit sales is not a problem. So that's another ratio sorted. The ratios are earning you half a mark, one mark, or one and a half mark. The first one, obviously, return of capital employed was definitely one and a half. And so we go on. Let's see if we can fit in another couple of ratios onto this page. It should be quite easy. So let's have a look at the next ratio. Perhaps we can put aside the trade receivables and days. That's under control. Then you've got number nine, trade payables and days. Obviously, you've got to tra your trade payable on top, 3,800. And then you have your cost of sales underneath, which is 18,000. Multiplied by 365, and you have your answer of, I believe, 77 days. Quite long. Till you compare it to Grappa, and you, un you understand that actually 77 isn't so bad. 108 is taking a long time to... So you can look at it two ways, I suppose. 108 is great in terms of saving cash, not having to pay out to your uh, suppliers, your creditors, your suppliers, people giving you goods and saying to you, don't worry, pay me in three and, three and a half months' time, 108 days. So in other words, Grappa is taking a long time, is able to take a long time, to pay its suppliers, conserving cash, which is why its cash balance may be a bit higher than Merlot's. Merlot, on the other hand, has to pay within 77 days, a whole month quicker than Grappa, and clearly that could have an impact on its cash flow, could be the reason for the overdraft, part of the reason why. But obviously, it's a, whereas it's a good idea to take a long time to pay your suppliers, you shouldn't overdo it and lose customer goodwill or Supply goodwill, I should say. So that's your ninth ratio done. Let's try a couple more of these. Tenth ratio is gearing percentage. Now be careful of this one. Many people got this wrong, according to the examiner. I'm going to bring in the from the ROCE, you see. From the ROC for Merlot, I'm going to bring in my the amount that we've borrowed. So if you're really, really careful, you might detect there. Let me see if I can find this. The 3,200 and this sort of area, 6,700 is what the examiner says should be seen as borrowings when you're doing your gearing. So that's where I'm getting it from. I'll now quickly lift that into my ratio towards the end of the second page. Here we are. The ratio that we're using here is 
gearing percentage, 6,700 from the ROC ratio, from ratio 1, ROCE, and then we're going to divide that, of course, by 9,500, which is the total capital employed, if you remember. Let's go have a look. Was that really capital employed? Yep, looks like. And so if you multiply by 100, you find yourself with 71%. Bit on the high side, don't you think? Whereas the other one is only 35.3%. So the examiner did say that he told his markers to accept debt to equity and other variations of the gearing formula. So don't worry about that too much. So there you are. Which one is better? I suppose most definitely the smaller, the lesser, the better. And so let's do a couple more ratios wherever you can fit that in. Interest cover. which is operating profit 2,000 divided by all interest, including overdraft interest, finance cost, 600, 310, and 290 from the income statement. And so it is 3.3 times, whereas the other one was 6 times. You can check that if you wish, but clearly the more times the better, the safer the company. And so we come to our last ratio. Take your time over this, as I've showed you there. Uh, 12, dividend cover, which is profit after tax, 1,000, divided by dividend, which is obviously 700, dividing one by the other, 1.4 times, and the one on the left, of course, 3.6 times. And the more, the better. So that's our coverage of the ratios themselves. What I need to do on the next tape, of course, is to take you into the interpretation thereof. So have a quick look. That's eight marks. Quite tight, I have to say, to get all that done in that space of time. But even though the mark is a bit mean on the ratios, it's very generous on the interpretation, so that's where it all balances out. So that's why I'd like you to stop the tape and we'll pick up interpretation in a few minutes. Thank you.